Okay, if you want to get your Bibles and uh, get to Acts chapter 9, there are some handouts on that back table uh, that uh, you are free to uh, avail yourself to. Uh, they will help you and uh, kind of follow along with this study this morning, so you uh, feel free to grab one of those if you want one or uh, uh, nudge somebody next to you and tell them to go get you one. Um, but uh, Acts chapter 9 is a, uh, is a tremendous chapter. Uh, we say that about every chapter, but this is a, uh, this is a significant study uh, because of what we read in this chapter. We were introduced, uh, as you're reading the book of Acts, you're introduced to a character by the name of Saul at the end of Acts chapter 7. And uh, at that point in, uh, in the writings is when uh, Stephen is stoned at the end of Acts chapter 7. And it simply says that they laid those who were doing the stoning laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 says that he was consenting with hearty agreement uh, to his death. Uh, and then Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 says that Saul was uh, making havoc of the church. He was entering into the homes, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. And so we have this character uh, in, this, uh, in the book of Acts that is that is a, a tremendous uh, opponent of Christ, a tremendous opponent to Christianity and to the church. And so when you get to Acts chapter 9 and read about him being converted, uh, that's, a, uh, that's quite, a, quite a turnaround and quite a, uh, a turn of events and, and obviously one that the Christians in the first century, uh, even some of them had a hard time believing uh, that it was genuine. But look in Acts chapter 9. You're introduced in verse 1 again. Then Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He wasn't just going to arrest them. That's what he was going to do. He wanted to go to Damascus to arrest them. But ultimately, he wanted to put them to death. It wasn't enough for Saul uh, to, uh, to just get these uh, Christians off the streets, uh, get them out of their homes and put them in prison. Uh, but his desire was that they might be put to death. And so he went to the high priest in, in verse 1. Uh, no doubt that was uh, Caiaphas, as we've talked about. And he asked for letters, letters of authority from the high priest to go to the synagogues of Damascus. So that if he found anyone who was of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so Saul is in Jerusalem in Acts 9. He wants to go up to Damascus. He wants to go up there with the authority of the high priest uh, to go and to find Christians, to arrest them, to bind them, to bring them back to Jerusalem. Uh, as you have on your handout, Damascus is 140 miles away. Uh, that's quite a distance. Uh, it's, for us, that's, that's here to Disney World. You know how far that is. That's, uh, that's here to Orlando. Uh, 140 miles away, he hears that there's Christians up there. Uh, up, in, uh, up in that area of Syria was probably one of the largest Jewish populations uh, anywhere outside of Palestine. There's a number of synagogues that are up there. He wants to go and to find these Christians. And so verse 3 says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Over in chapter 22, when Paul recounts this event, he says it's about noon. So you have the noonday sun already in the sky. And about noon, a light that is brighter than the sun. Uh, when you read over in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 26... I think in that account, when he's uh, telling this uh, particular story again, he says it was brighter than the sun. It's the middle of the day. There's a light that shines around him that's brighter than the sun. Verse 4 says, He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, calling him by name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? If you were Saul... What's going through your mind? How do you know my name? How did, who, who is this? How do you know my name? 
calls him by name. If you're Saul, what are you thinking? Are you in trouble? A bright light shone around him, the verse says, from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What does Saul say? What's he ask in verse 5? Uh, who are you, Lord? Uh, a term of respect. Uh, who, who are you? He's trying to wrap his mind around, okay, I know who I've been persecuting. And now I'm seeing this light from heaven. Uh, he, uh, who are you, Lord? New King James. Um, and King James have a section here that says, Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Um, okay. Had, had Saul heard about Jesus before this time? Uh, yeah. Saul had heard about Jesus. Um, it's, even, uh, it's even possible that Saul uh, had seen Jesus at some point during his ministry. We don't know that, but there's, uh, uh, there's no reason to believe that he had not witnessed some, uh, some uh, event in the life of Jesus. He had perhaps seen him. For sure he had heard about him. And now he has a one-on-one -on -one encounter on this road. He heard Stephen. That's right. In Acts chapter 7, he heard Stephen preaching about Jesus. And now one-on-one -on -one, he sees, it's not just a light that he sees. He sees Jesus. Look down in, uh, look down in verse, uh, I was going to say verse 17. Look down in verse 17. It's somewhere in that verse. He came laying hands on him. This is Ananias. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road. This was not just a light uh, that shined around him, uh, but he, he saw Jesus there on the road, uh, and, and throughout his writings, he talked about the fact that, that it was Jesus who he saw in person um, on that road to Damascus. What does it mean it is hard for you to kick against the pricks or kick against the goads? That's an interesting phrase. What does that mean? It's hard for you to... If you don't have that, if you've got American Standard or New American Standard, you may not have that uh, here in chapter 9, uh, but you have it over in chapter 26 uh, when Saul recounts this event. Uh, what does that mean? It's ox language. It's ox language. Okay? Uh, ox language for the, the drivers uh, of, the, uh, of the oxen would have their, would have their long sticks uh, and, and they would prick or goad the oxen in the back of their legs to get them to shuttle onward. Uh, but uh, what, what if the ox didn't like getting pricked? And he thought, look, I'm bigger and stronger and meaner than you. If you're going to prick me, I'm just going to kick you. What happens if the ox just tried to kick against being pricked? <laughs> he's, gonna, he's pricking himself. He's going to stick himself, and so there there wasn't a whole lot of uh, wasn't a whole lot of good in kicking against those the goading and the, and the pricking because you're just doing yourself harm. It's hard for you, Saul, to kick against the goads. Perhaps an indication that his conscience was perhaps already bothering him a bit. Um, if if you were killing Christians, shouldn't your conscience be doing something? Shouldn't your conscience be bothering you if you're killing anyone? And yet perhaps, perhaps when he, go back to Acts chapter 7. The, the response that is made uh, in Acts chapter 7 to the preaching of Stephen. Um, the response that was made back then was that they could not resist the wisdom with which he spoke. 
when Stephen was preaching uh, to them, go, it, it's in Acts chapter 6, it's not in chapter 7, although he was preaching in Acts chapter 7. But it's in Acts chapter 6, um, down in verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke to them. He's preaching about Christ and there was nothing they could do to answer him. There is no answer to truth. And so they, there was nothing they could do to respond to him. And if Saul was there and if Saul was listening to this, perhaps Saul was recognizing, you know, there's, I don't have a response to this. I don't have an answer to this. What do you want me to do, Lord? In Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, the Lord told Saul, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. It's kind of shameful. Hold your finger there and go to chapter 22. It's kind of shameful what people do when they're desperate, looking for, uh, looking for contradictions, as if they could find any in the Bible. Look at Acts chapter 22 and verse 9, when Paul was recounting uh, this event. Acts 22 and verse 9, the Bible says, And those who were with me, Saul said, indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. And so those who are trying to find some kind of a contradiction, see in Acts 22 where Saul says, Those who were with me uh, did not hear the voice of him who spoke. And then Acts chapter 9 says that those who were with him hearing a voice, but didn't see anyone. Now, is that a contradiction? Did they hear the voice or not hear the voice? Well, say that again, Jackie. In, in chapter, tw in, in chapter uh, 22, right? In chapter 22, is that, that's New American Standard? says that they did not understand. And that's the word that's used over there in chapter 22 is that they heard the voice, but they didn't understand the voice. Anybody ever watch Charlie Brown? You all know what I'm talking about? I mean, you understand Charlie and Lucy and Linus and whoever else is on that. But when the, when the teacher speaks on Charlie Brown, have you ever heard that voice? Yeah, sure, you've heard the voice. Did you understand what the voice said? Um, not exactly. So can you hear something and not understand it? Can you hear something? Uh, I, well, I won't pick on husbands and wives today. But can you hear something that your husband or wife says and maybe not? Well, we won't go down that understanding road. Um, but that, that's the whole point here. It's not a contradiction. Um, come back to Acts chapter 9. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. He had been blinded by the glory of the Lord. But they led him by the hand, brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. These first nine verses are quite a turning point in the life of Saul, in the life of the church, in the, li in the history of Christianity where its greatest enemy all of a sudden is having a change of heart. Now flip over to the back of your handout if you've got your handout. And as we review some of these things in these first nine verses, look back up in verse 2 where Paul, Saul back then, wanted to go to Damascus to find those who were of the way. What an interesting way to describe Christians. But it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that's used throughout the book of Acts. Uh, by the way, it, it may be helpful for you sometime to go through the book of Acts, and you can go through the whole New Testament, but go through the book of Acts and find all of the different ways that God uses to designate and describe Christians. He doesn't just call them disciples. He doesn't just call them Christians. There are a number of phrases um, that are used. He uh, looked down in uh, look down at verse fourteen. 
Ananias recognized that Saul had authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. It's a way of talking about Christians, about those who have called on the name of the Lord. It's interesting in Acts chapter 9 um, that you have this word, look in verse 13. Ananias said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to who? Your saints. How much evil he has done to your saints. Who are the saints? Are those, are those the dead people that, 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 uh, that have uh, received great honor and have uh, become saints after their death? He has done great evil and harm to your saints. Look over in verse uh, 33. Um, no, back up to verse 32. It came to pass as Peter went through all the parts of the country that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. Drop down to verse 41, where it says, Then he gave her, Peter gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Another way of describing Christians is the word saints. And three times here in Acts chapter 9, uh, that's what they're called. But at the beginning of the chapter, they're described as the way. Why do you think they're described that way? The way. Does your, does your Bible have a capital W on way? Why are they described that way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They were followers of the way. Josh? Yes. They, 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 were, they were considered uh, as, as, uh, as a sect. Another word when you get later on in the book of Acts, S-E-C-T, uh, that's used to describe uh, these individuals. They, and so they, they are separated out. They're, they're identified as certain individuals who do certain things and walk in a certain way and behave in a certain way, and they're just the way. That's kind of exclusive, isn't it? I mean, if he was going to that city to find people who were of the way, would he know how to identify them? Should Christians be identifiable? There were Christians in Damascus who were identifiable. Was he going to confuse them with, with, with some pagan? Was he going to confuse them with some average Jew? No, he, they, were, they were an exclusive group that could be identified. Should Christians today be an exclusive group that can be identified? If someone were to go in search of people who are of the way today, would they find you? Would they find us? Or do we just blend in and we're a part of a broader way instead of the way? Also look down and see how Jesus says to Saul, you are I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Why did Jesus say it that way? Why didn't he say, I am Jesus, the leader of the people you are persecuting? Why did he say, you're persecuting me? Jesus is in heaven. You can't touch Jesus. How are you persecuting Jesus? When you persecute the Christians and you persecute the church, what did Jesus say? You are persecuting me. Is it possible for us to separate the head from the body? Separate Christ from his church? You know, there are those individuals that want to do that. Say, well, you take the church and I'll take Christ. And here's Christ saying, you can't separate the two. When you oppose Christ, you oppose uh, Christianity. When you oppose Christianity, when you oppose God's people, you're opposing Christ. And even Jesus taught that during his lifetime. As you look at this passage again, you see that Paul goes into the city. Verse 9 says that he was three days in the city. 
eating and drinking nothing. He was fasting for three days. What else was he doing? The end of verse 11. When the Lord spoke to Ananias, he told Ananias, Arise, go to the city called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's doing what? He's praying. Did the Lord know Saul's heart? I mean, he knew what he was doing. He knew he was praying. He knew he was doing that activity. Did the Lord know his heart? Did he know his disposition? What, what do you imagine was the disposition of Saul? Three days, blind, chose not to eat and spent the whole time praying. Who is he praying to? By the way, what, what God is Saul praying to? He's praying to the God of heaven. He's, he's a Jew. He's praying to Jehovah. Isn't that the same God you pray to? Yeah. What do you think Saul was praying? Is he praying for, uh, is he praying for the sick and the widows and the bereaved? What, what do you think he's praying for? Ruth, you had your hand up. Right. That's right. You look down, what, what verse is it? Is it verse uh, 15, 16? Um, where uh, he says, uh, the Lord said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. When did God identify Saul as one that he wanted to go and preach his gospel? Did, so God, knew, what Ruth is saying is that God knew Saul's heart even before this time. But now God knows his heart. The, the, does, does Saul have a penitent heart? Do you suppose that his heart is full of sorrow for what he had done? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. His mind has got to be racing, putting all of this together. He spends three days praying. But the point of what we're trying to make is, did his prayer save him? Did the fact that he spent three days fasting and praying, did that save him from his sins? It did not. And so for, for those individuals who, who want to teach that what a man needs to do in order to be saved is to accept Jesus into his heart and to pray and ask God to forgive him, here's a man who was doing that. Do you suppose we don't know. Do you suppose that Saul ever said in that three days, God, please forgive me? Suppose he ever said that? If he had connected that Jesus, who appeared to him on the road, that he was persecuting Christians, who was persecuting Jesus, that Jesus really was the Son of God, who Stephen and all of those said that he was, and that what he had been doing and persecuting and killing Christians was against God. Do you suppose anywhere in those three days he ever said, God, please forgive me? And even if he did say, God, please forgive me, was he forgiven? No. Because that's not according to the plan of God. And when Ananias was sent there, Ananias was sent as a preacher of the gospel to go and to preach unto Saul. And what did Ananias say when he got there in Acts 22 and verse 16? He told him to rise and to do something in order that he might wash away his sins. What does that indicate? He still had his sins. And so when you, when you, look, at, when you look at the life of Saul at this point... Saul of Tarsus, and we, we need to understand this because even sometimes we might have a, a slip of the tongue. We're going to come back to that must in just a minute. Uh, sometimes we might have a slip of the tongue and talk about Saul being converted on the road to Damascus. And your Bible may even have as a chapter heading 
or as a paragraph heading, it may even say Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus or something like that. Was Saul converted to Christ? Was he saved from his sins on the road to Damascus? He wasn't. He was not saved on the road. And we won't take time to look at all of this. You have it on your handout. Uh, But as you look at the progression, it, it was Saul saved when Jesus appeared to him. No. Was he saved when, he, when Jesus identified himself to him? No. It was, was he saved when, when Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting? No. Was he saved before Jesus told him what to do? Jesus said, go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Was he saved at that point? If he was saved, why did Jesus tell him to go and do anything if he was already saved? Go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Was he saved after praying for three days? Was he saved before Ananias came to him? If he was, Ananias was confused when he got there. Because Ananias told him how to be saved. You look at the whole progression and it's obvious when Saul was saved from his sins because Ananias said to him, Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. And that's... uh, that's not, that's not some Church of Christ doctrine that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to uh, belabor on. It's a very simple point that's made in this, in this passage. Here's a man praying for three days. And yet when the preacher gets to him on that third day, he still has his sins. And the way he is told to remove those sins, come back up to what Jesus said... Jesus said, you go into the city and there you will be told what you must do. It's not optional. It's obligatory. Whatever you're told, you've got to do this. So whatever Ananias was going to say, it was going to be required. And what Ananias told him to do was to arise, be baptized, and wash away sins. Anybody have any questions or comments? Anything you want to say about that point? Go back and and start looking at Ananias coming then. Look at Ananias coming to him in uh, in verse 10. And uh, if you were Ananias and the Lord came to you and told you to go and to preach to Saul, can, can can you respect Ananias' response? Can you respect Ananias saying in verse 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. Saul had a reputation. How much harm or evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here in Jerusalem, or or in Damascus, he has authority. Remember the letters he got in verse 2. He has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Did Ananias have a point? Was, Was all of that information true? All of that information was true. Ananias is in an uh, interesting position. He's in a Jonah position. He's, say it again. He's in, a Jonah He's in a Jonah position. The Lord told Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh. Why did, not, why did, why did uh, Jonah go the other way? Why did he run the other direction? Because he didn't, he didn't want them to have the opportunity. He, he didn't believe they had the right to be able to repent and to turn around. Um, And uh, so perhaps Ananias has that same thought. Not not only would, if Ananias goes to him, would he be putting his own self in jeopardy? In in Ananias' mind. Is he putting himself in jeopardy? I go to him? Sure, yeah, he's penitent. Uh Uh-huh, sure he is. And I get over there and he's going to kill me. Or the other part of what Ananias is thinking is maybe what Jonah was thinking. Lord, are you serious? This guy's been killing Christians. What right does he have to hear the gospel? Dirk? We also need to focus on obedience in this situation. Ananias was obedient to Christ's command. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Ananias went and taught Paul what Christ's command was, and Paul was obedient to the command. Right.
Right. It's, it, it's, it's always that obedience aspect that is frustrating. It's, they, it, it's like you want to be a part of a company or a country or something. There are things that you have to do in order to gain that desire for it. Right. You just don't get it by wishing for it or saying, I have it. Yeah, and, and Dirk's right. There, there is the, uh, an emphasis here on obedience. There's the obedience of Ananias. What does verse 17 say? The Lord told him in verse 11, arise and go. The Lord told him in verse 15, go. So what does Ananias do in verse 17? He goes. There's the obedience of Ananias. There's the obedience of Saul when he gets over there. Ananias preached to him. Do we have any indication that Saul tried to argue with Ananias or disagree with him? Uh, is there any indication that Saul, when Ananias got over there and said, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, that Saul said, are you kidding me? I've been praying for three days. I'm already saved. I don't need to be baptized. You're making that stuff up. Any indication Saul did any of that? Uh, there, there was, uh, he was obedient to the will of God. And as Dirk said, uh, we saw that example in the life of Jesus. And so Ananias, in verse 17, went over, laying his hands on him, said, brother Saul, Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you came, as uh, he has sent me to you that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Boy, some people just grab a hold of that word brother and think it's the end all of everything. And they think that indicates that Saul was already a Christian because Ananias was calling him brother. Really? Is that the best they got? What is, uh, go back to chapter two for a second. Look in chapter 2 and verse, we can look in verse 37, look in, look in verse 29, Acts chapter 2 verse 29, what did Peter say? Men and brethren, oh wait, was he talking to fellow Christians? Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. He was talking to individuals that he just told them that you killed Jesus. Were these people Christians? Well, Peter just called them brethren. Look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Were they Christians? Were they brethren in Christ? No. What are we looking at when we see Ananias calling Saul, brother Saul? Uh, were they brothers, Jewish brothers? Yes. Uh, were, they, uh, were they related uh, in that way? It, it, it's also a, a term of, uh, of endearment, of friendship. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's in no way an indication that Saul was already a Christian. Verse 18 says, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. He received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. As you begin looking uh, at the conversion of Saul, notice that it says that he did spend some time with the disciples in Damascus. It wasn't until he got down to Jerusalem when the disciples were really concerned about him. But there in Damascus, the disciples received him. And he went and uh, spent some time with them. Verse 18 begins with the word immediately. What, uh, what word does verse 20 begin with? Immediately. Immediately he was baptized. And then in verse 20, immediately he began to preach. What did he begin to preach? Did this have to be, did this have to be weird for Saul? To go and preach the very thing that he had been persecuting. To go and preach the very message that he had been dragging people out of their homes for believing. What a, uh, what a strange sensation that must have been. And yet, was this something that he merely thought to be true? Did he, did he just think that, yeah, this, this might, there might be some, some real truth to this Christianity thing. Was this just a, a notion that came upon him? Or was he convinced of it? 
You know, we, we look at faith. We look at belief. And for some reason, there are individuals that want us to think, because they think, they want us to think that our faith, our belief in Christ is some leap in the dark. Well, you, you, you know, you just, if it makes you feel better, if, if, it, if it gives you a warm fuzzy, then you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that's okay. Is there any evidence for it? Was Saul, was Saul presented with any evidence to prove what he was now preaching in verse 20? The Lord Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. If Saul had ever seen Jesus, the last time he saw him would have been on the cross. Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And so if Saul ever saw Jesus, the last time he ever would have seen him would have been on the cross. And now he sees him in heaven. When Saul goes preaching, Jesus is the Son of God. This wasn't just a, well, I'll change my religion. I'll get more followers. It wasn't anything about his self, himself, that made it change. He was thoroughly convinced that Jesus really was deity, that he really was Son of God. Richard? Uh, he was a zealot and he was educated. Yes. That's absolutely. That's true. That's true. He, he's he. Uh, uh, Richard says Saul Saul was highly educated. Um, he, he's not only he's not only highly educated, but he is. He is a, uh, he's uh, very high up in, in the Jewish religion, uh, in, in, their, in their system. Here's a Pharisee, here's, uh, here's someone highly respected, and he knew the law. And isn't it interesting, I, I'll get to you in just a second, Dirk. Drop down and look in, verse, uh, uh, look in verse 22, where it says, Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus. What was he doing? How did he confound them? By proving that Jesus is the Christ. He was not just going out and saying, Jesus is the Son of God, you need to believe it. The Bible says that he was proving it. And the word that's used there, the Greek word that's used there is a compound word that means you bring things together. How, how, how would that indicate that he was proving Jesus to be the Son of God. As Richard says, here's a man who knows the Old Testament. Did he know Old Testament prophecies? Yes. He was bringing Old Testament prophecies and the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus of Nazareth, he was bringing them together. And when you bring those Old Testament prophecies and the life of Jesus and you bring them together, what does it do? It proves that Jesus is the Son of God. That's how strong the evidence of prophecy is about the deity of Christ. One other point, dirt real quick. Yes. He 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 got he got it from G and we're gonna we're gonna compare Galatians one. We'll, we'll finish this next week. We're gonna compare Galatians one with what happens here in, in Acts nine. But one other quick point. You you want some evidence? For the validity of the resurrection of Jesus? How, how, what is one? There are multiple evidences for the resurrection of Jesus. Here's one. The greatest persecutor of all time was converted to Christ. Why? Because he knew. Not just thought. He knew that he had been raised from the dead. Thank you all so much for your good attention. We'll finish chapter 9 next week.